Welcome back to Student of the Gun Homeroom, and today we have a very serious topic that we're going to discuss. Now, if you've been paying attention to the media here lately, you'll know as I record this, it's only been a few days since a, uh, a mother had to defend her small children against a, a home invader, against a felon, a nasty, vicious piece of human debris. And if you're a dad or a husband, this is one of your worst nightmares, the nightmare that you are off at work doing your thing and you've left mama at home with the kids to defend the castle. It's the middle of the day and here's mama tending to her children and some piece of human debris not only tries to break in, but smashes in to rob and or potentially harm your family. Now, if you're a smart dad or a responsible dad, you've left your wife with something to defend the castle with, some type of firearm to stop that bad guy. Now, this particular instance that uh, took place in Georgia, uh, it's a win for the good guys. Uh, it turned out well. Uh, it was scary and terrifying, I'm sure, for the mother and her small children. And for the husband, who was actually at work and had his wife call him and say, hey, there's some creep trying to get into the house. Uh, I can't imagine hardly a more terrifying situation than being far away from your wife. She calls you and says, someone's trying to break into the house. Actually, I can deal with that because I had that very same situation happen to me many, many years ago. I was traveling. I was far away. I was talking to my wife on the phone. Actually, we were texting back and forth, and all of a sudden, she dropped off. I'm like, hello, where, where are you at? And she didn't come back on. I'm like, hmm. So she texts real quick, I think someone's out there. I'm like, whoa. So I called my buddies at the police department and said, get over to my house right now. Well, it turned out all right. My wife grabbed the gun, let the dog out, and the person that had been trying to break in heard the dog barking, heard the wife coming, and took off. So it's a win. So I can... I can uh, uh, a relate, so to speak. Well, in this instance in Georgia, what happened was the, the mom, she did everything right. You know, some guy's trying to come in and she's like, I don't want to deal with the door-to-door -door salesman. I don't need this. Then he keeps banging on the door, ringing the doorbell. And she said, this, this ain't right. She calls her husband. The husband's like, look, call, cop, call the cops. I'll call 911, get a gun, take the kids, get them upstairs. You know, the police are on their way. Well, like happens quite often, before the police can get there, this previously convicted felon, a violent felon who's out of jail, okay, breaks into the house, starts ripping through the house. Finally, he finds the mom and the two little kids hiding upstairs in the you know closet area. And fortunately, she had one of these. And so as soon as he rips the door open, he had a pry bar, she empties it on him. All right. Shoots him with with the 38 caliber revolver. Uh, he's like, whoa, this is no fun anymore. And he gets up and he runs out of the house and gets in his car and he drives and crashes and the police arrest him and so forth. Uh, he's expected to survive his wounds, and uh, but he is arrested and so the mom is okay, the dad's okay, the kids are okay. Felon is in jail for the time being. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this particular instance. And number one, what do we learn? She fired all six rounds out of her 38 special revolver into the neck and face area of the bad guy. The bad guy is not going to die, okay? And did the bad guy stop hurting her? Yes, he did. But did he stop because he was physiologically impaired and could not continue? Or did he make the psychological commitment to surrender or flee or what have you? It was a psychological stop. It wasn't a physical stop. The truth of the matter is, what we learn from this situation is, handguns, as we, you know, gun guys have always known, handguns are very, very poor man stoppers. You say, well, if they're so poor, then why do we carry them? Well, because they're convenient. That's why. Uh, people get really antsy when you walk around, go into the grocery store with an 870 shotgun over your shoulder. Uh, they don't like that. So you put a gun on, you cover it up, and nobody's any the wiser. We carry handguns because they're convenient. We don't carry handguns because they are the absolute best man stopper on the planet. Because if they were, then all of our Marines and soldiers, when they go overseas, would be carrying pistols instead of rifles. And they don't. The rifle actually is the better man stopper. Well, so what's your point, Paul? My point is this. She shot her gun dry. The bad guy decided, he made the decision to leave. Now, because he had enough gas left in the tank to get up, go out of the house, get in the car, drive away. If he would have been mentally impaired to the point where he didn't care about the gunfire, he could have legitimately, 
physically continued to attack the mother and her small children. And that's a bad situation. Um, yay for the yay team, go team. He did not do that, but he didn't do it based upon the injuries he received. From a physical standpoint, it was more of a psychological standpoint. And for a lot of years, I've been talking to people about keeping a gun in the house. You know, since I've been married, I've been married 20 years now. And as long as I've been married, we've always had a gun in the house that every adult in the house knew where the emergency gun was. And uh, we call that, I call it the fire extinguisher gun. Why? Why do you keep a fire extinguisher in your house? Just in case of emergencies, right? You put the fire extinguisher in one spot. Every responsible adult and child in the house knows where the fire extinguisher is. Hey, if there's a fire, run, get the extinguisher, address the fire. Okay, well, the fire extinguisher gun is the exact same thing. It's the same concept. Everybody knows where it is. It's always in the same spot. If there's a crisis, run to get the gun and use it, do whatever you have to do. And then for the longest time, this gun that's in my hand right here, this particular gun, uh, this was our fire extinguisher gun. Uh, we kept it where it needed to be. It was a six-shot, 38 special revolver, and, and it worked out just fine. However, what I found is that my wife, and as my children got older, my daughter is now you know, a teenager, and my son is an adult, uh, my son and I shoot a lot because we like to shoot. We enjoy it, and it's part of our job. The wife and the daughter, eh, not so much. They shoot when they want to or when it's convenient or when dad pulls them to the range and says, come on, let's go shoot. What I discovered was that, uh, for, especially for my wife, who you know has a job and kids and all that, that her range trips were mm, three, four, five, six months in between each range trip. And that's really practical. I'm sure if you're sitting out there thinking, mm, that's probably about the same, it's been a year and a half or two years since my wife went to the range. Well, Shooting skills are perishable. There's no getting around that. And the fact of the matter is, is what I discovered when I would take my wife and my daughter out to the range to shoot the fire extinguisher gun, the double action 38 special revolver, was that uh, it would take them two or three cylinders worth of ammunition before they got from groups that were this big, you know, at five yards, down to groups that were this big at five yards. And I thought, that's not really the whole point of having an emergency gun. I don't want you don't have six to twelve rounds of practice warm-up ammo before you can actually put your shots on target, and that's not a good thing. Well, I've been carrying a Glock for a long, long time. This is a Glock 17, and so what I started doing is I took my Glock 17 to the range and uh, let my daughter shoot it, and let my wife shoot it, and I found that right out of the box, you know, they they picked it up off the bench, they aimed in at the you know silhouette five yards away. And instead of putting the first six, seven, twelve rounds into a group this big, they put all the rounds into a group this big. And they also enjoyed shooting it a lot. And uh, both my wife and my daughter are like, eh, let's, I, I don't really want to shoot the revolver anymore. I want to shoot the Glock. Let's shoot the Glock. So they enjoyed shooting it. They had confidence in it. And they could do it over and over again repeatedly. They could repeatedly put rounds where they needed to be. And when it comes to saving your own life, that's a pretty big thing. That's pretty important, especially the confidence factor. You don't want your wife, when there's a vile, nasty piece of human debris or a piece of human debris and two of his buddies coming into the house, uh, you don't want her thinking, oh my Lord, I haven't shot this thing in a year and I don't even know if I could hit anything with it. That's not really good confidence. That's not the kind of confidence you want. What you want is your wife to be like, if that dude comes in the bedroom, it's all over with because I know what I'm doing. Okay, so having confidence in your tool is a pretty big factor. Now let's talk about ammunition capacity. Back in the olden days, and the olden gun writers, and uh, you know, a lot of guys that I grew up reading used to like to say things like, well, if it can't be done with five or six shots, then it probably can't be done. Blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? 30, 40 years ago, when the double action 357 Magnum or 38 Special Revolver was the sidearm, that was true. I mean, I guess it was true because that was really all you had. You know, 30 years ago, when I was real young and coming up, if you wanted an auto or an automatic pistol, uh, the two most popular ones were the 45 1911, seven rounds. Uh, at the time, or a Browning High Par, which is pretty rare I'll get back then. So everybody had six-shot revolvers, and they used to say sh stuff <laughs> like, uh, you know, six rounds. If you can't do it with six rounds, it probably can't be done, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's 2013 as I, as I record this, and the fact of the matter is there are a lot of good, 
high quality firearms that aren't that expensive that hold more than six rounds. Okay, for instance, the Glock 17. How many rounds are in the magazine? 17 rounds. Uh, so this this Glock 17 and it has an excess sights, big dot sight, and it has a crimson trace grip on it. And somebody said to me, well. Well, isn't that overkill? You got a big dot and a crimson trace. Look, dude, this is the fire extinguisher gun. This is the gun that my wife, my daughter, my oldest son, this is the one that they're going to be grabbing to stop the bad guy from coming in the house or the bad guy and his nasty, sick friends from coming into the house. Okay, there's no such thing as overkill or too much. Okay, there's no such thing as overkill. Uh, I want my family, my wife, my daughter, my children, I want them to know that they're going to be able to hit whatever they need to shoot. And also, I had, I love these guys. Well, I don't love them. I, they make me sick. Uh, when I suggested using a, a Glock 17 or Smith & Wesson M&P or an XD or something like that as your fire extinguisher gun, they said, well, how many rounds do you think you're going to need? Well, dude, first of all, I don't know how many we're going to need number one. Number two, I would rather my wife or my daughter have rounds left over when the fight finishes than be in the middle of the fight and run out. Okay? How selfish and short-sighted are you to say stupid things like, wow, if you can't do it with six, you probably can't do it. Oh, so your wife fires six and they're still on her and she gets raped and murdered. So you feel good because you withheld her to only six rounds because that's reasonable? That's a bunch of bull crap. It's short-sighted and it's stupid. So stop saying stuff like that. And if you say stuff like that and you don't like it, suck it. I don't care. I want my wife, if my wife uh, if a, I'm, she's home alone with my kids and some piece of human debris like this guy in Atlanta busts in the house, I want her to go ahead and have rounds left over. Or if she has to put 17 down range and reload, rock on. Okay? So stop saying stupid crap like, oh, if, it, if you can't be done with six, it probably can't be done. Because here's the reality of the situation in Atlanta. She had an empty gun in her hand when homie decided to get up and run out. Now, fortunately, he decided he'd had enough and he wanted to leave. You don't know that. When the guy comes in, is he tweaked out on meth and he doesn't, he's not even going to notice you shooting him? You don't know that. So this, all this crap about if you can't do it with six, it probably can't be done is exactly that. It's crap. If you're going to have a fire extinguisher gun, if you're going to have a gun in your house that's an emergency tool for your wife, your children, you know, whomever to use in a crisis situation when the police are five minutes away, I would rather they had more rounds and I would rather they had a gun that they had confidence and faith in. I want them to know when I wrap my hands around that thing, I'm actually going to be able to shoot what I need to shoot. So the fire extinguisher gun, if you've got a fire extinguisher gun in your house, you might want to think, A, is this a gun that my wife, my family, that every responsible adult in the home is going to be able to use and they're going to have confidence in. And also, are they going to have enough rounds, hopefully, that they've got some left over when the fight's over? All right, enough said. So, from me to you, for all things student of the gun, I want you to go to studentofthegun.com.